Welcome to the Cowboy Up Podcast, where talk is all about the West. This episode is brought to you by White Stallion Ranch and produced by Cowboy Spirit Radio Network. The African-American soldiers, known as Buffalo Soldiers, served the United States from the 1860s into the 20th century. Their remarkable contributions occurred not only on the battlefield, but at West Point, at our national parks, and overseas. Historian John Langelier joins Russell Nell to share their stories, which he chronicles in his new book, More Work Than Glory. Morning, Alan. How are you? Uh, always happy to be here. I tell you that every week, and it's always true. So, uh, well, great day in the spring here in Tucson. Boy, it is a great day. Man, yeah. I'll tell you this is why. March in Arizona. The Southern green, Arizona. The gorgeous green that's been covering the ground in one week's time is not green anymore. It's, uh, well, it's just not green, you know. It's, it's it's starting to fade cover. the green. Yeah. It was a golf course, and of course El Nino is our friend. Um, we have a great guest with us today. He's in, entrenched in Western history, Arizona history, and of course we love that. Yeah, that kind of keeps us afloat. His uh, <laughs> Arizona subjects, but especially Arizona history. So John P. Langelier spent. Uh, Four, de- four decades in public history after graduating from the University of San Diego and Kansas State Universities. He grew up in Tucson. Uh, he spent a dozen years with the U.S. Army, helped found California's Autry Museum of the American West, um, served as director for Wyoming State Museum, deputy director of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library, and, of course, we we like to hear about that. It's, President Reagan, of course, appointed your sister, and um, also as executive director of Arizona Charlotte Hall Museum, and that's in Prescott. It's a very well thought of museum. Director of Arizona Historical Society Central Division. He uh, went ahead and retired in 2015. He's written dozens of published books, served as film consultant, most recently for Love of Liberty, hosted by Halle Berry and uh, has produced documentaries. Today he joins us to talk about his most recent book, More Work Than Glory, Buffalo Soldiers in the United States Army 1866 to 1916. John, we've kept you out, but that's been because of your lengthy resume. It's good to have you here. Well, it's great to be here, and I hope some of that that you said was actually true, too. It sounds like I'm important, which I really am not. <laughs> well, you've got Thank quite you a resume. You, you've you uh, you've touched a whole bunch of places in Arizona that that make me happy. I'm a big, you know, big uh, native Arizonan, so uh, that uh, always makes me happy to get somebody as knowledgeable as you to to be here and talk. And Alan, I think you guys uh, met a few years ago. Is that right? At the uh, in Tempe. Charlotte Hall. At the at no. in Tempe for an event for the horse lover. Oh, okay, yeah. So that's right. Thanks. I I actually it's one of the few books that I haven't written uh, that I have read. It was a great. <laughs> 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 well. Uh, well, we're just glad to have you on on the show today. So, uh, what, what, let's start with the term "buffalo soldier." What? Uh, Where'd that originate? Yeah. What? What's that about? Well, there's numerous uh, ideas where it came from, and many of them are conflicting, and some of them probably not true, but. Frankly, the term starts in the Civil War, not referring to black soldiers at all, but Southern uh, whites who were pro-Union living in the South, and it was meant to be a derogatory term. Flash forward a few years later after the Civil War had ended in about 1866-67, and a white army officer was speaking to an elder of one of the Native American groups, probably a Kiowa, 
and uh, he was referring to white Texans as Buffalo soldiers, and again, in a pejorative way, saying, well, they're only good to kill our women and our Buffalo. They're not real you know, fighting men. So it started out in kind of a nebulous form, but probably by the early 1870s, it came to refer to the black soldiers serving them in Texas, and uh, it was probably had to do with the fact that to some Native Americans, uh, the Buffalo soldiers appeared, the black soldiers, to them like buffaloes, black, a black mane, black hair, and a, a dark visage, a dark face. And so that's probably as close as the reality is from the earliest sources. Over the last 50 or 60 years, lots of lore has been attached to it, but every one of these other explanations uh, have no uh, substance. They're, they're like fake news. Somebody says this happened, but doesn't demonstrate that this actually was the uh, the case from from original documents. So yeah, fake news uh, been around a long time. It just they, they've taken it to a fine art now. Yeah, yes, they have. Yeah. And uh, but it's it's nothing new. And a matter of fact, every time I read uh, you know hundred year old, hundred fifty year old newspapers, you always read between the lines and say. What's, what are they really meaning here, and what's their what's their point of view? So uh, you have to even take primary sources with a with a grain of salt. Where where were the original regiments of the Buffalo Soldiers located? Well, after the Civil War, 180 plus thousand African Americans had served in the Union forces, and so uh, as somewhat of a reward uh, by the federal government, and uh, also in recognition of the, the fighting. Uh, prowess of the the black troops they created the the four uh actually originally six black regiments in 1866 and they were originally posted for, uh, as reconstruction troops on the uh part of the the coast the eastern coast in the south uh, they were formed uh, the 10th cavalry perhaps the most famous of all the units uh was formed in in uh, originally kansas at fort riley and then uh, actually originally at fort uh, leavenworth and moved on to Fort O'Reilly. The 9th Cavalry was in uh, the New Orleans area, but they all tended to eventually move uh, to the American Southwest, meaning Texas, Oklahoma, then known as Indian Territory, and then to New Mexico, and uh, ultimately to to the degree up in Colorado. In the long run, over the first 50 years of the existence of these black regiments, they'd served everywhere from Hawaii to uh, Alaska to California uh, to uh, forts in New York and Vermont and even in the Washington, D.C. area uh, at Fort Myer, Virginia, just south of the national capital. So they were pretty much everywhere in the country west of the Mississippi at one time or another and a few posts uh, east of the Mississippi. Were so, they mostly Reconstructionists? Did they rebuild uh, uh, the West, if you want to call it that? In, in the first generation, because there's multiple generations of, of the black soldiers in their experience, uh, that is true. They're part of the, the so-called frontier army. They're taking place in the uh, the Indian wars of the era, whether it be against the formidable uh, Comanche in Texas or ultimately the tragic incident of Wounded Knee with the Lakota, with the, the Sioux people. Uh, they were part of the shock troops in the West. And they had the reputation of being some of the best troops in that, unlike a lot of the white regiments, let's say Custer's uh, famed or infamous 7th Cavalry, depending on how you look at it, uh, desertions were rampant and men tended to, even if they stayed their five years enlistment, uh, they often would not re-enlist. Whereas the black soldiers uh, saw, rather than the military as a job of work, they saw it as a profession of arms and so they tended to enlist and re-enlist and spend 20 30 or more years uh in in the ranks and uh had also for the most part the lowest desertion ranks uh rates in the army rather than going over the hill which sometimes was 20 or 30 percent of a unit strength sometimes they only had two three or four people leaving or a very small percentile depending on the time period wow and and, and so in some ways, you're saying they they were uh, better soldiers, fewer deserters, more dedication, took it more as a career. But 
the 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 thing that I've already learned is that it, it wasn't just a southwest or western deployment. It was everywhere. You've said Hawaii to Alaska. Were they deployed differently than than the white? Um, Actually, units? that's that's a, a great question. And initially, some of the earliest publications, secondary publications that started essentially in the 1960s with with William Lucky's the Buffalo Soldiers, the uh, Negro Cavalry in the in the West, later on changed to the to the uh, Black Cavalry in the West. They tended uh, to be posted in the areas of the American Southwest where there were less contact with white soldiers and certainly less contact with white civilians. Uh, that was particularly an issue in Texas because Texas was not the best place to be deployed if you were a black soldier. But then again, in the immediate period after the Civil War, it was not a good place for any soldier to be placed was wearing a blue uniform because the Texans held a grudge longer, it seems, than some of the other areas of the South. And don't forget these soldiers, one of their initial uh, reasons they were deployed where they were, is they were the reconstruction force, the occupation force that was sent to bring the Southern Confederacy back into the Union. And that took place well, you know, into the early 1870s when ultimately numerous reasons changed. But uh, they, they pretty much were sent to the same place as white soldiers were. Uh, sometimes they spent longer in an area, but there was a, a report by one of the commanders in Texas saying he had two regiments, one black and one white, that had been always uh, stationed in the same place. It was time to give these fellows a break and get them, you know, out of uh, out of Texas, out of West Texas, and into more uh, conducive areas so they could be near quote civilization, whatever civilization meant at that time. And there was also some uh, thought that the soldiers received uh, inferior equipment and inferior mounts and uh, that sort of thing, and which was all untrue. Matter of fact, the soldiers made the exact same pay, received the sa- exact same equipment, and in some cases actually were even given experimental equipments with the realization that these fellows were on the cutting edge uh, as combat troops. They were in the vanguard during the Indian Wars in some areas, and so... Uh, they not only received uh, special equipment or weaponry, but in one case in the 1890s, long after the frontier supposedly had closed, they took place and were the, the leading group of the so-called uh, bicycle corps experiment, mm-hmm. where ultimately fellows from Fort Missoula in far western Montana rode all the way uh, to uh, St. Louis, Missouri, which is roughly 1,900 miles and today we think, well, that's a long ways, but we have all these modern, you know, off-road bicycles and things. Well, in those days, they didn't have pneumatic tires. They they didn't have brakes. They didn't have X number of speeds. These were not uh, trail bikes. These were the type of bikes that we had as kids, like swim bikes that were, you know, not made for anything but riding around the neighborhood to go to the local baseball game or something. You think they walked so, and pushed quite a ways? Uh, that's affirmative. But, of course, cavalry did the same thing. As you well know as a horseman, yeah. you get off your horse as much as you get on your horse. And uh, so, so, they, yes, and in some cases they had they had 60 pounds worth of equipment, their rifle, their ammunition, their food, uh, everything. And they'd wow. come to a, to a stream or a river and there's no bridge. What are you going to do? Wait till somebody comes along and builds one? No, you you got to pick up the dog on bicycle and schlep it across. But these guys never had seen a bicycle for the most part in their life and certainly had not ridden one except for the young commanding officer, James Moss, who was the, one of the founders of what we know today as Flag Day and later in his career. But you got to say, uh, who, thought, who thought bikes were a good idea? To, yeah, to and do how, how big combat? were the detachments? You know, well, in the, were in there the, a lot of them? No, this was a very small de- deployment of the 20, 25th Infantry. And we're talking a couple of squads, a sergeant, a few in- other NCOs, a bugler, one guy who was the repair guy because these stuff, every so many miles, you'd have to repair a flat tire, you know, they're, they're worn out. They weren't, you know, exactly hardy types of things. So we're talking well, less than two dozen men, one officer, and a surgeon at one point, and a newspaper guy, because, of course, hey, this is news in the 1890s. Bicycles were kind of the rage in those days. And so 
it, we had one reporter because an embedded reporter as, as it were of, of his era so small groups and these guys actually ended up bulking up i mean they turned out to be you know <laughs> kind of jocks <laughs> you know you go through all that for a year year and a half and you're not kind of the the little the little scrawny kid off off the, the farm in in south uh, you know carolina or whatever so, so it was, john i'm learning a lot and and there's a couple of things that that surprise me and i want to make sure i've got it right are you in the big picture is it this is the first question is it fair to say the buffalo soldiers were treated reasonably fairly you said equal pay equal equipment sometimes they got some experimental stuff is it is it true to say and other than being segregated they were being treated fairly by the military that's what i'm talking about that is true Okay. The civilian population, depending on where they were and what time period, a totally different picture would emerge. But the military, yes, they did. And I had a question many, many years ago when one of my earlier books came out. Well, what about the officers? who be, They were all white with the three exceptions of the three graduates of West Point and the black chaplains eventually. And wow. I, did a, I did a study of the officers compared to, say, like the seven cavalry and such. It didn't hurt their careers, and as a matter of fact, people like George Patton, uh, although he was seconded to the 10th Cavalry, John J. Pershing, uh, and and Omar Bradley all were amongst many officers who served with the black units, and their careers evidently didn't do too bad. Uh, even George Marshall, who was uh, uh, technically uh, Eisenhower and and MacArthur's superior officer, although I guess MacArthur never acknowledged anybody superior yeah, to him. I think that might be right. <laughs> but they, their, their careers went on just fine, and in some cases, because they were cutting-edge combat troops, etc., they ended up getting promotions a little faster in certain cases uh, and recognition than their white counterparts and some of the other regiments that guarded Milwaukee or whatever. Well, experience wins in 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 military often. I mean, I, I've seen where the National Guard guys who are way older than the young Air Force guys win in the mock uh, um, sky battle. So we're going to take a break and we'll be right back because I have another question that is based on a surprise. Thank you, gentlemen, cowboys. I love the stories that you tell. You know, this reminds me, uh, many years ago in my past life, I was a history teacher, and I loved the subject of history. That's why I love doing these programs so much as a part of one of the production team. I remember one day I was walking down the school hall, and I was just, you know, behind some uh, group of students, and uh, they started a conversation. They obviously didn't know I was there. And uh, one of them said, well, hey, who do you have for history? And someone said, oh, we have Houston for history. And then the other one says, well, I hate history. She says, oh, no, it's quite interesting. We just get a lot of Stan stories. (laughs) Well, I guess that's true. And uh, this truly is what history is all about. It's not just facts and figures and dates. It's about the human experience, which we can all learn from and perhaps even love the stories that come from that. You know, that's part of the reason why I have established and am making you aware, and obviously my friends here are aware, we have what we call the Cowboy Spirit Radio Network. Cowboy Spirit USA Radio Network. And our goal is to have people like you say, hey, I believe I have a story to tell. Maybe I should even start my own radio program, my own podcast. Uh, Is that possible? Well, the name of my company also is What It Takes Radio, and we're here to do what it takes. That's right, what it takes to help you tell your story for uh, your business, for your organization, for a special cause you have, or just simply you would love to be a part of the men and women who tell their stories on the radio, perhaps of the Western tradition. And by the way, oftentimes we tell people that if you've ever wanted to write a book, we can help you write the book by never writing a word. All you have to do is uh, start to uh, tell your story on a podcast, and from that we can create that book for you. How about that? Have fun telling your story, and uh, perhaps someday actually write a book. 
Reach out to me at stan at witradio.net. That's stan, S-T-A-N, at wit, radio, all one word, dot net. Maybe someday you will be right here on the Cowboy Up podcast talking about your program or your book. Well, now let's get back to the program. More stories are coming. So another surprise, John, for me was, and, and just ignorance-based surprise, I'm sure, Texas held a grudge, you said in, in a general comment, longer than possibly parts of the deep, deep South. Did I, A, get that right, and if I did, B, you have a theory why? That's a surprise to me. Well, Texans, uh, you know, Texans are Texans. And, you know, it was the Texas Republic before it was a state of the Union. Uh, and uh, while Southerners certainly did not embrace black soldiers or Union soldiers completely, uh, their presence just wasn't in any of the southern states but Texas or what could have been con- uh, construed as part of the old Confederacy. For the most part, until the Spanish-American War, where all four black regiments were called up as some of the first troops to be mobilized and sent to, to uh, Tennessee and, and that area, and then ultimately to Florida to ship out to Cuba because they were stationed in Cuba as well as in the Philippines as part of their, their military uh, combat experience that they had. And since they were some of the longest serving troops and with the most experience, as you had pointed out, they were old, old soldiers who had been tested. But once they went to the south end, there were some incidents, but they weren't there long enough as they were in Texas, where they were in Texas literally for decades in certain cases. And so uh, familiarity breeds contempt, perhaps one could argue, uh, and, but it was the contact. Conversely, Arizona had few incidents uh, when they were stationed here, and on and off from 1880. Through World War II, black soldiers were part of the military force at Fort Huachuca and Nogales and, and Douglas and, and Naco and elsewhere. Isn't and, uh, uh, Fort Huachuca sort of the, uh, what is it? It's, it's, it's got the Buffalo Soldiers Museum and it recognizes, what is that connection to Arizona specifically? Or is there? Well, that, that's, that's a great question. A, an old colleague, a friend of mine, was Jim Finley, who was the historian and, and museum director for many years, essentially dubbed the term that uh, Fort Huachuca was the traditional home of the Buffalo Soldiers, or you could say the spiritual home. Indeed, all four black regiments that had been reconstituted in 1869 when the Army was uh, redefined to the 24th and 25th Infantry and 19th and 10th Cavalry's black troops served there. But that was not unique. They also served at the Presidio of San Francisco and some other places. What made them unique was the duration of time of black troops at Fort Huachuca and the fact that in World War II, both of the black uh, divisions uh, were at, at one time or another formed at Fort Huachuca. So it, it had a, a distinction. And today, the Buffalo Soldier Day is observed very much at, at the post, uh, which is July 28th of each year the year when the four black regiments were reconstituted or uh, reorganized. And so it it traditionally has been a a place that have honored black soldiers all the way through World War II and all the way through the coming of of desegregation and ultimately integration after Harry S. Truman's 1948 uh, executive order so proclaiming within the Department of Defense. When when uh, World War Two and before and after that, uh, were the duty assignments a lot different for the black soldiers than they were for the general population? No, actually, they they had the same duty assignments. Uh, and uh, it's, there was there's an author, a historian who talks about the versatile 
Frontier Army, and indeed many units were called upon to do the same thing. But the same thing wasn't just combat. They, they, the black soldiers as well as white soldiers were the precursors of the Border Patrol. They, the national parks have been around since the 1870s, but until 1916, there was no uh, national park service. There was no border patrol uh, till the 1920s per se, and so they took on those duties. They were firefighters in in uh, the devastating fires up in in uh, the Great Burn, as it was called, and prior to World War One, that wiped out a great deal of the American West up in the far west, Montana, Idaho, particularly. Uh, so they 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 formed many many roles uh, in a time that the government didn't have specific agencies. And they were this, they performed the same roles as their white counterparts. Well, let's talk about the national parks because you have a role there and at, at the National Park Service. And what did they do there? Since there wasn't somebody, they didn't have a staff. You said until 1916. What what were the There's, Buffalo Soldiers doing there? And what's your role with the Park Service? Well, I, as you mentioned, had retired, but the Park Service was kind enough to, to let me make up for some of my mistakes with the federal government. And then for two years, I came back. I like the as, way you word that. <laughs> yes, well, you know, even, even people like me perhaps deserve a second uh, chance. But uh, at any rate, that's that's dubious um, and others would, con- would not concur. But in this case, I was asked to come back as essentially the chief curator for a Buffalo Soldier project that had been mandated by the U.S. Congress to explore the place of the b- black soldiers in the national parks. Uh, and that would be twofold. Number one, some of these places were not national parks when the black soldiers served there. Classic example is, say, Fort Davis, Texas, or Fort Pulaski uh, in the south, where soldiers had been deployed, but as active duty, specifically uh, when they were forts. However, in the case of Sequoia and Yosemite, um, black soldiers were the, the uh, forerunners of park rangers, just as their white counterparts had been up since the, in Yellowstone, safe in the 1880s and in elsewhere in, in the parks, uh, as performing the same duties as rangers, keeping poachers away, uh, making fighting fires, uh, making sure that the, the laws were, were obeyed within the parks. And in the case of, of Charles Young, perhaps the most famous of the black soldiers, certainly the, the last graduate of West Point in the 19th century, he became the first African-American superintendent of a national park at Sequoia. And in his season, one season there with two troops of, of the 9th Cavalry coming out of the city of San Francisco, built a lot of the infrastructure that we still use today when we go to Sequoia. Uh, and uh, in the case of the troops that were deployed to Yosemite, uh, one of the surgeons that was with them actually started an arboretum and, and a, uh, a museum that still is it kind of looks at the floor, particularly of, of those parks. So those were great roles. And he, let's face it, it was a lot more fun to spend the summer being a park ranger in one of those two most incredible, beautiful places rather than back at the barracks polishing boots and shoveling you know what in the stables. So. so- why what what made charles young famous was it um you because you said west point grad first superintendent was 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 it those aspects or also as a soldier as a as more traditional role as a soldier numerous aspects he he was just but quite simply brilliant and dedicated. And according to one account of the period, he was beloved by his men. He was no, you know, okay, I'm going to cut you some slack. He was, he was a, he was a tough soldier, but he was no Martinet. And he was somebody who could be looked up to not only by the black soldier, but by the black community. He was a, an associate and, and actually friend of W.E.B. Du Bois, who was one of the great black intellectuals of the era um, he he was deployed to Liberia. He was deployed to Haiti as as a military attaché. He wrote uh, some publications about the, the black soldier and their use and their history. Um, and he was a colonel essentially at the outbreak of the uh, war in World, you know the First World War. 
he having served in in Mexico with uh, with an active battalion uh, chasing Pancho Villa and de- doing some deployments and tactical uh, innovations that had not been utilized before, charging with machine gun support and all that sort of thing. And so the only his only downfall was the prejudice of the era. He was black, and he really would have been slated in, uh, uh, more than possibly as a brigadier general during the First World War. And, and so uh, he served in the punitive expedition under Pershing and with, with Patton, is that right? Yes, well, actually, Patton was a very junior officer, seconded to, to uh, Pershing's yes. headquarters. But, but uh, the 10th Cavalry and the 24th Infantry, both black units, were deployed deep into to, to Mexico and were some of the only ones to actually see combat or, or be occupation forces there. And uh, he was very successful, unlike... A, 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 some of the troops from the 10th Cavalry led by white officers who were, both of the officers were killed and all their men wounded uh, or killed with a very few exceptions of some of the fellows who managed to escape the, a debacle uh, led by an overzealous couple of white officers who I guess were, were looking for to be the next Custers and unfortunately they, they were. In they sort of did, yeah. <laughs> so right. this Charles Young, who I'd not heard of, it sounds like a. Is there a book you recommend? Is there a biography of Charles that, yes, that someone young, should read? Young, yes, young young is actually uh, has a biographer who um, has written two volumes about him. Uh, one is his days at West Point, and let's go to West Point for just a second, and then we'll get back on track to your question. Uh, the West Point days for a black uh, in. Uh, cadet and there were roughly three dozen of them uh, but only three of them were managed the rigors of of passing west point uh mainly not only the rigors which i couldn't you know have actually ever taken care of but for three years or for the four years of their life as cadets no one spoke to them except officially really? so it's you know, stand at attention, Mr. You know, Young, or come to the board and do this this calculus equation or or whatever. Um, and uh, it it was it was a absolutely incredibly difficult cold time. And as a result of that, um, the the um, these these fellows were under far more pressure than their aver- the average cadet was. Uh, to who, to, who would uh, volunteer for that? Well, Someone it was of Charles prestige. Young's ca- caliber. Yeah. Well, it was. It, let's face it; it was prestige in this period of time, the 1870s, uh, which it was the first black graduate of West Point was was uh, uh, Henry O. Flipper from the 1870s. It was the prestige of going to West Point uh that still is prestigious it was what it was the top engineering school of its time uh many of the great graduates whether they have been Ulysses you know, grant or later on people like uh eisenhower so it was definitely definitely the prestige it was an opportunity to get a uh an education that you would not get anywhere else at this same time that we're talking about my grandfather barely went to a couple of years of you know as, as a first and second grader and, uh, as, and so this was this was definitely uh, a, a uh, part of upward mobility, if you will, um, to get an education, to, to have a profession, not just well, a profession. Well, and isn't it fair to say, I mean, in truth, they were used to prejudice anyway. So, I mean, if you're going to be mistreated, you might as well do it in a big job and get get a, a, a jump forward, which they did. And it doesn't make it right. But, I mean, I'm sure it wasn't something they were unused to. Is, is what are the books? In, in case somebody uh, I'm, wants to I'm, read, I'm, I'm sitting here trying to find a copy of my own book so I can look at the bibliography. Oh, I and People me, can look what, it up, Charles Young, and you no, know. no, I, I, I've got it right here. I actually keep one copy of each of my books. I never read them, but they're they're, <laughs> they're, they're somebody somebody asked what the uh, uh, you know what what I think about something, which is oftentimes not worth hearing. 
but I'll, 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 I'll wrap up with that question after I figure out where in the heck my reference is. And my colleague who wrote both of the books will be humiliated that I didn't know these right away because he's a better historian than I am. But that's oh, that wow. very, you know, you can t- you can edit that out of the program. So, <laughs> well, hey, baseball season's getting going here before too long. There's, there's some connection with baseball. Ah, uh, yes. We can do a whole show on that maybe later on when my next book comes out. Uh, we'll look but, forward to uh, that. But there is a connection between the Negro League and the Black Soldiers. Baseball goes back until at, at least the 1880s with the 10th Cavalry here in, two, in Arizona up at Fort Whipple. They played games against white teams, and we're always thinking about uh, you know people like uh, Jackie Robinson and Willie Mays and such. But black soldiers were playing baseball against white teams, not integrated teams. The white teams were white, and obviously the Buffalo Soldier teams were black. But back into the 1880s, and it became more than a game. The 25th Infantry Station here in Arizona after they left terrible assignment in Hawaii. What a wretched place to be stationed. Uh, <laughs> they, they loved it, as you can well imagine, for a lot of reasons. Uh, came here and they played. Some of us are old enough to recognize this name, the All Stars, under some guy by by the name of Casey Stingle back in the 1920s. Wow! And they were they were good enough two out of three games to beat the pros uh, coming out of these various teams who were barnstorming. You know, after the season, these guys made no money in the National League and American League, etc. So they they had to get day jobs after after they were on on the road. Um, or after after postseason, and so they would definitely um, be playing, you know, pickup teams anywhere. And the 25th Infantry, whose nickname was the Wreckers, and they did they wrecked most people's uh, <laughs> situations in terms of their their good records and that sort of thing. Uh, the Wreckers were quite an amazing team, and some of them went to the Negro leagues. Wow. Well, as time ticks away, let's circle back to why we're here, the book, um, More Work Than Glory. Um, talk about the title and the book real quick. How, how did you get that title? I mean, isn't, that's probably the, the reality for most soldiers. Well, of course, you always struggle with a title for any book, and supposedly the, that's going to help sell the book. But in this case, a colleague of mine, a former National Park Service individual who spent much of his career with the Park Service uh, doing yeoman uh, work on the Buffalo Soldiers, uh, and indeed the, the, the book is in part dedicated to Bill Waltney, uh, Bill came up with the title, so I can't even take credit for the doggone title. So I mean, <laughs> that's how bad I am. And but I was able to you know, balance between what modern what research I had done for fit the last fifty years on the black soldiers of my own with other books like Brian Shellum's two books S H E L L U M on the black officer in a Buffalo Soldier Regiment and uh, his other book, which is. Uh, on on the black cadet and a white bastion both on young and so i was able to take that type of thing and kind of balance between the two two types of polls i.e things that had been written by others and things that had been taken from from the records of, of the era that i was covering 1866 to 1916 and indeed uh bill's idea of more work than glory was true these guys worked very hard but until more recent times, got very little credit for what what they did, and uh, I also wanted to change up, not making it necessarily a military history, but biographical in many respects. So while I do address the missions of the uh, the, the troops and such, I really tried to look at the individuals themselves, both enlisted men and officers like Young and Flipper and and, and the Black Chaplains, many of whom are kind of personal heroes and then get into some of the myths in the book. So I was trying to take a different approach than has been done by others, and indeed with my own self, uh, some of my earlier works. And, John, the book's available wherever you get books. Uh, is that correct? Yes. And and I, while I don't want to promote uh, you know, the, the mega 
uh, Amazon. Amazon is gives you the best deal. Yeah. <laughs> they they can sell they can sell books cheaper than I can buy them myself unless I want to buy a lot of them, and I don't do that because then I'm stuck with a lot of books. <laughs> So okay. Amazon, but you know bookstores, they go in and ask for it. And you, you can go, you can go into the Barnes and Noble, absolutely, and and acquire them. Uh, and uh, but it's from Helion and Company, which is a British publisher. But their their distribution point is here in the United States through a company called Casemate. But Amazon is a quick and easy way, a painless way to get get the book, uh, and. Uh, I find that when somebody just wants one copy, that's where I refer them to. If they want multiple copies, then I suggest they go directly to the publisher. And what's next? You you kind of alluded to something might be on the horizon. Well, there's a company called History Press. They're also uh, Arcadia Press. They're there yeah, too. I've done a couple of books with them. Right. Well, they're doing under History Press the my Buffalo Soldiers in Arizona, which will cover from 1880 all the way up through World War II. And I'm frantically trying to get that finished by uh, the end of May because I have to go on the road. I worked for Stephen Ambrose historical tours during part of the year, giving tours of Little Bighorn and the uh, up, uh, up in the northern plains and then my Apache tour in October down here in Arizona through New Mexico. So, well, um, well, let's stop you right there. How do people find out about your tours? If they go on to Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours on their, to their website, uh, they will see everything from the 80th anniversary tours of, of uh, D-Day, which regrettably I'm not part of this time around, to my tours and Civil War tours. So it's, it's a potpourri of anything military, U.S. military history. Chances are you'll find a tour that, that they do. And, of course, Stephen was the... Uh, uh, author of the uh, Band of Brothers, which is perhaps one of the most successful TV series when it came yeah. to things military. So Stephen Ambrose historical tours, people could, and you've got something in the Apache a tour here yeah. in Arizona. Right, an Apache tour in Arizona, New Mexico, and then a tour of the uh, the, the Plains Indian Wars with the with the Sioux and the Cheyenne up and. We do everything from from Little Bighorn to Rosebud to Wounded Knee. It's uh, it's it's an amazing six days. And at the end of it, I keep asking, why am I doing this? I'm tired. But anyway, I do it every year because it's a lot of fun. I was just going to ask you how long it was, and you gave me the answer, the six days. Yeah, I, I was envisioning various answers to that. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, Lynn is poking us. We've gone way long. More work. Then Glory, Buffalo Soldiers in the United States Army, 1866 to 1916. John Langelier, Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours, thank you very, very much. You know, I um, this was a uh, you know I love doing the podcast, Alan. Of course, getting to spend time with you and Lynn, but I love surprises, and this was this had a lot of surprises in it for me. I thought it was really interesting. Uh, Patton, Pershing, Bradley, to a certain extent, General George Marshall, all may have climbed the rungs of the military with the support of the Buffalo Soldiers. I didn't see that coming. I had never thought about that tie-in, and it very probably is, is correct. Well, because clearly they were, the, they were the professionals. They were the ones who took it like a job or a career, better yet. I would have liked to have heard a little more about the conflict or how they tied in together, you know, with the blacks and the whites and working together on the same jobs and the same assignments. Well, we'll just have to ask them. reread the book. Yeah. Well, that's a wrap from the West where history continues to fascinate. We share it not only here, but on Facebook, Instagram, and our website, CowboyUpPodcast.com. That's CowboyUpPodcast.com. Give us a follow. Give us a like. 
a Western shout out to Stan Houston's production company. Next week, conversation turns to horses and genetics and why and how to get to know your horse down to the DNA. Until then, I'm Lynn Weezy Sneed reminding you to sit tall, ride safe, and take a moment to enjoy this Western tune. On the western sky, two thousand head of steers took flight. Good night, pain, those boys to ride. And by damn, they would, though some might die. Don't say goodbye to the cowboy way. Tradition lives. And it's here to stay One hundred years ago and strong today So don't say goodbye To the cowboy way She's ten years old on a stout bay horse Three hundred years They guide her course From the Spanish quest To the blue and gray To what we call The cowboy way Don't say goodbye Don't say goodbye To the cowboy way To the cowboy way Traditionally and it's here to here stay, to stay. One hundred years ago and strong today. So don't say goodbye to the cowboy way. Raw hide and steel, hooves and horns. Legacy to the yet unborn. A code that comes from a hard-lived life Your destiny when you're born to life Don't say goodbye to the cowboy way Tradition lives and it's here to stay One hundred years and go strong today don't say goodbye to the cowboy way. Don't say goodbye. Don't say goodbye to the cowboy way.